Hi everyone and welcome to Magic Numbers. We're on episode 18, which is the first episode of the 2022. And today I'm going to be talking about the art of forcing. Uh, it's going to be all about how to use data to find archetypes that you can force, uh, how to predict color pair depth with ALSA, and how to find underdrafted archetypes and how to build around the cards that will be more available to you than the others. Um, Then I'm going to give you a couple of examples of my analysis for the uh, Crimson Vow Quick Draft. And I'm going to also tell you why Quick Draft is the better thing. And today, for the first time, we're going to have a practical session. So basically, at the end of the presentation, we are going to try to force a draft in, in, in the Quick Draft. So uh, And we'll see how it goes. Maybe it will go absolutely terrible and you will learn that all that I was talking about is uh, complete bullshit. Maybe it will just do uh, about fine. But we'll try to determine the plan before we start the draft and try to stick to the plan during the draft and see how it gets us. It's not always like 100% going to work, but it, I think that it's going to work uh, sufficiently enough for you to, uh, to basically try to use it yourself uh, at some stage when you want to quickly rank up and you are short on gems and just want to do several quick drafts. All right, without further ado, and this is a preamble that um, I, so basically I start every presentation with the preamble just to give people time to come in and uh, get comfortable. And it's my sort of soapboxy moment. And this one is a conglomerate of thoughts of several content creators I've been following. One of them is being Dafor. Um, I'd like to give him a special mention because uh, quite a lot of this, um, so yesterday he put a, a thread on Twitter that was talking about forcing archetypes, which was not an inspiration for this episode as I was already finished with it by that time, but it really well complemented uh, my thoughts and I, and I uh, you know, incorporated some of his thoughts, but I want to give credit and not just steal them. But <clears throat> when you play drafts, the best drafts are the ones where you First pick something and then you smooth sail uh, throughout the whole draft with a consistent plan. Third link is good because it makes you more flexible and it uh, allows you to uh, position yourself well in drafts that don't go according to the initial plan. But I think that your initial plan in every single draft should be, I'm going to stick with my first pick. And if that's possible, I'm going to do it. If that's not possible and if the format is tricky, you have to start drafting the hard way and that's going to be very, very often the case. But in some cases, you're going to first pick, and then second pick is exactly the perfect card you need. Third pick is exactly the perfect card you need. Then you know that your colors are open slowly, and, and, and it goes smoothly. And these are the drafts that you're going to trophy more frequently than the ones when you draft hard, um, uh, the hard way. Drafting the hard way being staying open for a long time and looking for an open lane. But in all fairness, it will increase your win rate to do so because not in every draft you will be capable of drafting from start to finish um, in a coherent way. But the drafts when you go from start to finish with a coherent plan are going to be the ones where you're going to get the best results. And this is important for uh, the concept of forcing because if you come up with a coherent plan before you start a draft, and if you know that this coherent plan has actually a large percentage chance of success, you can basically get the best possible outcome of a draft most of the times you start it without um, uh, paying attention to the uh, to the packs, just focusing on your uh, on your things. And I did it quite a lot in um, bot drafts beforehand. Uh, for example, in Eldraine, I was first picking any red commons really, and I was drafting mono red decks and with amazing success, you know, like probably around 50, 60% trophy rate uh, because bots in Eldraine were not picking red high enough and you could make this super aggressive deck that was uh, based on a uh, cheap creature, lots of seven dwarves, uh, lots of uh, barrages, the, the, the plus two plus two and gives trample uh, combat trick on attacking. And those decks were really, really strong and I knew that I can force it almost any time. And sometimes I just notice, oh, there's something wrong. Red is not happening and then I just which to uh, either mono white or mono blue uh, artifact synergies. And, and I was doing this instead and also with pretty decent uh, results. So if you start with a plan that you know you can enforce, you can actually get a much higher win rate. 
The problem is finding the plan that you can enforce. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And what are the pros, what are the cons, and what are the possibilities of doing such a thing? So first of all, forcing. What I don't like about it is the name. It is a very negative term. When I think about forcing, I nothing pleasant comes into mind. And I think that because of the term and because of the use of language, it's a bit vilified and treated a bit unfairly. I think that forcing is very essential in the early format uh, when we are still in the stage of the limited discovery. And it's never used. Uh, the term forcing is usually not used when you do that in the early, um, early days of the set. Usually you do, oh, I'll do it for science. And that sounds much better. But it is essentially forcing. You open a strange build around Rare and you start drafting uh, around it and, and basically trying to force a deck that will utilize this Rare very well. Um, <clears throat> and forcing is also treated like something, well, if you cannot draft, you force. But I think that actually forcing is a very difficult strategy to master. And I will give you a couple of examples of players who, who, who do sort of forcing strategies quite frequently, uh, and they are not bad players. It's just, you can force mindlessly, and that's a possibility, and you can force with a um, deep understanding of the format. And these are the completely two different sides of the same coin. Right. So forcing is not a black and white term. There are shades of gray. There is hard forcing. And hard forcing is very, very difficult in human drafts, but it's possible. Uh, a very good example is LSV, who was uh, hard forcing blue-black in the beginning of the Midnight Hunt. Because blue-black was so open that he knew that, you know, if you do 20 drafts, probably 18 of them, I will end up with a very good blue-black deck, and he was doing that. But it was because he knew that humans are did not catch up with the which cards are good in the format, and he already did, and he could abuse that um, uh, situation to his own benefit. However, hard forcing can be pretty abusable with bots, and I will touch on why is it uh, more likely to do with bots um, than with humans. Um, and if you're doing it with humans, it would be good if you have a completely different pick order than the rest of the table. Uh, so very often, weird build around decks were the ones you could force because you knew that you were going to get all the important pieces of your puzzle uh, quite late. Um, and examples was maybe Dovin Acuity deck in um, uh, Ravnica Allegiance, where people were not on it initially. And the first people that figured it out, they went on the GP or a Pro Tour even, and uh, they did exceptionally well in the limited portion because they were com drafting in a completely different game because they were picking cards that no one was interested, like Clear the Mind. And, and Dovin's Acuity was actually also not considered like super strong. They figured out how to build a deck, what were the important pieces of it, and most importantly, figured out very important pieces of it that were super underdrafted, and they could abuse that strategy to the great result. And I'm pretty sure it was the same case with the um, uh, first people that figured out uh, spider spawning decks. Uh, it was the case with Ryan Sachs when he started drafting the uh, whatever unblockable one two in Amonkhet. And there are several uh, other cases in the history of limited magic where people figured out a niche deck that used underutilized cards um, and they could uh, pilot it to great success. I think that um, Kyle Rose, aka the Hum TV, did it as well with the red blue archetype in Terrors Beyond that uh, he was forcing it soft. Uh, but he was getting there quite a lot of times because he knew which cards are important, and those cards were slightly underdrafted in that format as well. So there is also this thing called sort of soft forcing. And this is like forcing that is dependent on the first few picks. You have several plans ready before the draft, but before you decide on the plan, you want to see your first few picks. If you get a couple of um, important pieces for a particular archetype, you can jump on it because you know already, OK, I have a guarantee of having those three picks that fit my plan, I can continue with that plan. But you also know that there will be pieces available so you can commit to it very quickly because the knowledge of how the metagame is um, looking, what people are picking, lets you know that, okay, I will get on average two of this card still in the packs that are uh, re that remain to be open. 
And um, these are key cards for my deck. So uh, I just have to be not unlucky that those cards are not open on the table, basically. And this also requires knowing your deck plan beforehand and possibly having several forcing plans at the same time. Uh, but you will use some information from the packs um, before you commit to a particular archetype. Okay, so first of all, forcing is not a mindless thing. And this is like something that, again, language is very important in, in, in those things. I think that when people think forcing, it's like, Oh, it's like forcing the door. You don't know how to unlock it with the with the with skill, so you just like brute force it. And even the term brute forcing uh, doesn't require any kind of you know intellectual capability. But forcing in limited should require quite a lot of uh, thinking activity if you want to do it correctly, in my opinion. So first of all, you need to scout the limited meta game, and you need to really know it. Second of all, you need to have builds that are at least on the conceptual stage quite ready in your head, how they should look like. Uh, third of all, combine those two things and know which builds are readily available and which ones are not. Because the fact that you have a good build uh, of a particular archetype, but uh, it will never get there because it relies on cards that are highly picked by other people, um, it doesn't give you anything in terms of like capability of forcing. Yes, I know that I want this deck, but this deck will never be open. So why would I even be bothered trying to force it? Um, Fourth part is mentally map priorities in the deck. Uh, and this is super important and probably undervalued. In particular decks, you should know which cards are absolutely essential. And even if those cards are weaker, let's say you open a good removal and a key card for your deck. If you want to build a particular build and that card is a priority, you should pick it over that uh, removal because plan is more important than the power of the cards when you do things like forcing. Those decks should be really plan-based decks and not the decks that just contain good cards because you cannot guarantee uh, getting past good cards because people know what good cards are and bots are programmed to pick really good cards. So instead of that, you should focus on the decks with a significant plan and quite a lot of synergy and those decks will be more likely open um, in any format and you can uh, think about them. And, <clears throat> and the last part, again, reiterate and apply this map of the deck that you have to the pick orders. And, you know, maybe adjust the plan based on the availability of a particular card. Uh, we're going to be talking about it later as well. But um, say, if you have a plan of drafting blue-red and you figure out that the uh, steal a creature effect is available, you can have any number of copies that you um, can possibly get, that can be a pretty strong um, game plan. So you might think of sacrifice outlets. Are there any sacrifice outlets? Maybe I should also prioritize them in the hope that I will get those um, uh, steel, uh, steel um, creature spells. And then if I can sack them, it sort of acts as a removal. And if I get a sack effect, it gives me some kind of a bonus. So uh, you might think about those things. And we'll be talking about other examples of that uh, as we look at the data. So first of all, scouting the meta. And this is the data from um, from best of one uh, human drafts from yesterday. So should be relatively fresh. And uh, you can see that archetypes in uh, Crimson Vow are not drafted equally. Ragdos is drafted 17.7% of the time by the 17 lands users. Uh, and that's quite a lot. That would mean that there is at least one uh, black red drafter per pod on average if not more of those. That means that probably this archetype is not a good place where you want to start forcing because it's heavily contested already. So you will not get uh, those good cards on the wheel unless you're drafting some kind of a really oddball version of it uh, that relies on cards that no one else wants, which is quite unlikely. But even if you do, you still have a chance of not seeing those cards because uh, people will just pick them because, oh, I don't want to send black signals or red signals. And the same goes with them, uh, Demir, Azorius, and Gruul. Th these decks are quite highly drafted, especially with Demir. It's highly contested and it has a pretty low win rate, which is a combination, um, which is a combination that um, you don't want to use for forcing. First of all, you are drafting a deck that is potentially weaker, 
And um, second of all, it is contested. So weak contested deck, that's not a good uh, uh, place for forcing. Uh, but if you look at the latter half of it, we have Izzet, we have uh, Selesnya, we have Boros, Golgari, and Simic. And I think that these decks are already starting to be pretty decent um, targets for, for, for thinking about um, 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 thinking about should I force it or not. Uh, and if I look at the win rates there, I, I see that Izzet and Boros are, are, are also quite high win rate decks. Um, uh, so uh, I might think about those two. And I see that Simic is super underdrafted. So uh, uh, even though it has a low win rate, it's super underdrafted. So if you can come up with a supreme plan of how to draft Simic, you might get there because uh, the cards that you're interested in, if they are going to be not super highly uh, contested, you'll get them and you are very likely to get all the multicolor things in that color combination. So um, uh, so uh, if you have a consistent plan for, for Simic, you might get there because it won't be super heavily contested. Um, and then is it is slightly more drafted than, than the other decks that are in the tail end, but it has a higher win rate. So maybe when you're thinking about forcing is it, you might think, okay, I can force is it, but red is pretty strong. Red is pretty highly drafted. Um, I might want to come up with a plan of using the cards that no one else wants. And um, I'm not saying that it does exist, but at least that's how you should start the approach of what can I potentially force in the format. So scouting the meta. Second part is building the skeleton. So figuring out your plans. So uh, you can find out good, but under drafted cards, you can figure out where they are, the, uh, they are at their best. You build theoretical decks and you can test them. Uh, and you know, you can do it twofold. You can just build deck skeletons and have a mate of yours or uh, well, a friend in general play you with their build and then see what are the strengths, weaknesses of those decks, what is missing, uh, what you can supplement them. Uh, analysis paralysis says that I think Sam Black said that three of the top semi cards are red burn spells. It's true, but those um, splash cards being on top of common lists for particular decks um, might indicate other things that you should take into account. Like for example, if you splash red in, uh, uh, in blue green, it might be that you also have Halana Alena, which will make the deck much stronger, which will increase its win rate, which will sort of bump up um, the performance of the red uh, burn spells. I think that, you know, there, there, there are also uh, the episode of uh, Sam Black's on, on Simic was actually fantastic. And I think that his plan for the heavy creature deck um, um, utilizing the underdrafted cards was exactly what I'm talking about. Although he doesn't force those things. And I think that, you know, there is just not, no, not a strong enough case for forcing uh, Simic in human draft. But, you know, maybe maybe there is a strong enough case for, for forcing um, Simic decks in uh, with bots. We're going to we're going to look at that. Um, so the important part when you are testing the, uh, testing those decks is to try to find what are the priorities, because this is the moment when you can actually figure out this card is absolutely essential for me. And I really need to, you, uh, prioritize picking it. Um, especially if it's not going super late, because if it's going, if, if it's going super late, you can sort of hope to wield them. But if the card is essential for, for the functioning of your deck, you cannot um, uh, really take that risk. So you rather lose a better pick, but have the key elements of your deck in place. Like, for example, you really needed to pick Clear the Mines a bit early later in the format in the Ravnica Allegiance because you knew that some people might pick it. And without Clear the Mind, the deck was not really operating. So you really wanted that uh, one or two copies of that card. Um, so then you need to pre-assess the availability of uh, the deck. And first of all, the statistic you want to use from 17 lands, and as always, all the data that I'm using is from 17 lands. Uh, I would highly recommend to use it to anyone that still doesn't. And I would highly recommend to take a look at data yourself most of the time, because 
Playing with data, even if you're a bit clueless in the beginning, makes you a better in interpreting data and makes you a bit better in magic uh, over the long time. And you know, there's plenty of people on Twitter uh, or discords that you can ask about uh, particular doubts that you're having about the data. Uh, ALSA is the average last seen as measure. And it means that if, if the card has ALSA of one, you only see it in the pack that you open. If it has ALSA of three, you on average see it as pick three. Now, sometimes you will see it on a pick four, as a pick four, sometimes as a pick two, but uh, on average, you'll see it as, a, as pick three as a last thing. So this is a card that will be picked relatively early, so uh, you won't see too many of them. And if it has also of over eight, you probably will see most of the ones that are opened um, uh, in the whole draft. And this is a very important thing because it tells you how many of the card you will see on average per draft. Um, then you can look at the current data of those cards because ALSA is updated daily. Um, if you look at the big tables on 17 lands, you see the generic um, average from, uh, from the whole format. But some of those values change over time. So some of the cards become more available as the draft format continues. Some of them become less available. It would be good to look at at least, you know, uh, the last week and see if there is a big difference between uh, the average and, 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 and what is currently happening. Because obviously you're going to be drafting now, so you want to have the values that are more representative to now. And then you can actually use that analysis to see which skeletons seem to be most open on average. Uh, yes, card like a nurturing presence in white blue is a good example of a card that will potentially be uh, quite open and uh, might be less open right now than it was in the beginning. So then you need to map the priorities. You already pre-assess them by building your skeletons, uh, but you need to play them, play around. I strongly recommend to watch particular people who are um, really good at um, at thought forcing decks or, or or drafting with super high preferences. And two names that spring to mind is the four that I already mentioned, and uh, Ham TV uh, Kyle Rose is an expert in figuring out an archetype, and then he just relentlessly drains it. I think that Ham streams are interesting. Uh, once he finds a good archetype that he knows he can force. He will just persistently do that and just smash people with it. Uh, and you want to watch them because they will draw attention to the key cards for each archetype. Um, I did the, this approach a couple of times with HamTV. I watched uh, his streams and I saw what he tried to do. I was not sure which cards are absolutely essential. I watched a bit of more streams and I sort of figured it out uh, on for my own. And I started drafting it and with really good results because um, his builds are very coherent. He's like a, a weird example of a limited player that behaves more like a constructed player because his decks seem like they are constructed. And I don't know, he's got super good intuition. I'm not going to tell you that um, you can become ham, but you at least can uh, can copy copy his approach to some extent. Uh, another part that you can actually is, uh, figure out is looking for weak spots, weak matchups, and based on those weak spots, sort of update your uh, strategy, especially if the weak matchups are the ones that you're going to be paired up uh, against quite a lot. Uh, so Zach, you're curious about what a good red-white skeleton looks like in Mature Vow. I actually have no answer to that question. Um, uh, I did not have a lot of uh, red-white drafts. Most of the time, it was just like red-white good cards. I didn't go for a very particularly themed deck in there. So uh, I can see that uh, uh, there can be a version of uh, red-white that uh, bases itself on Kessig Flame Breather. But I just think that it's going to be a weaker one than the uh, blue-red. And I can see that there is going to be a red-white skeleton that uh, bases itself on um, on uh, nurturing presence. But I still think that the white-blue deck uh, will be better um, to do so. So yeah, it's in this uh, awkward spot where um, it, it can sort of uh, utilize both uh, strategies, but um, it will be worse than the than the than the decks that the, those cards were sort of designed for.
So boats and sails that I've been forcing 15 land boroughs built using flames and angers uh, with some good success. And yeah, I mean, I totally can see that happen. I, I, I totally see that those decks can, can, can be relatively open and you will most of the time get uh, uh, everything blue, white. But one of the problems is that, the, sorry, blue, uh, white, red. The only problem is that, you know, like white, red has the probably poorest rare in, in, in the multicolor rare slot. So uh, that's that's a bit of a bummer for it. So yeah, I mean, looking at those things, you can figure out several solutions to to um, to making those uh, archetypes more coherent and using the cards that are more available uh, because you find better plans over time and you try to adjust your plan to fit the, those cards, uh, um, those cards that uh, that work. Josh says that I just dropped RB. It works. And again, I would like to quote a great man. Yes, but you can also you, you probably can win with like. 40 land decks or something, having seen you play. Okay. Pre-assessing availability. And again, we look at ALSA of key cards in your special builds and look at current data of those cards and see which skeleton seems to be most open on average. Um, so I, I talked about it a bit before, so there's no need of uh, dwelling deeper in it, especially as I'm going to give practical examples of those. And then you can oh well well, well that, that 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 okay that that's why I was talking about it before because I I went back instead of forward. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, I'm going to use bot draft today to um to do the practical session, and there are several reasons why bot drafts are better for this strategy than uh, human drafts. First of all, bots have a more predictable behavior. I think that initially um, Arena had maybe few personalities of the bots, so they were super predictable. When you knew the Alsa, you knew exactly where you would get each card and uh, uh, and uh, yeah, because of that, you, you could basically plan up your draft. And the only thing that uh, was changing your strategy or changing your results was what you opened in the pack because you knew exactly where you're going to get particular cards and and people abused it quite badly uh in several formats then they did recalibration of the bots i think that right now they have slightly more personalities but more personalities are not enough to do the same as you get with human drafts when you get a large variety in skill level, a large variety of preference, a large variety of drafting styles. Uh, so humans are basically more unpredictable and bots are more predictable. And this predictability gives you a reliable draft experience and bot draft sort of uh, becomes a different game. Like I did play several bot drafts in uh, AFR and I used it as a sort of training exercise to uh, master drafting the red-black in AFR. Because first of all, red-black was very open with the bots. You could got, get all the cards that you wanted um, from, the, uh, from the draft. And then I knew that uh, red-black is really good, but there were several subtly different builds. And I was experimenting with more treasure-centric builds that uh, planned on, on, on dumping like a 6-6 six, six on turn four. Uh, and make your uh, opponent sacrifice hopefully two permanents and win the game like that. Or some of them that were more like reliant on the steal and suck uh, uh, mechanics and, and some of them that were just value piles and they were very mid-rangey. And all of them were functionable, but I knew that I can do that because I knew that I have a particular cards are going to be always available for me. Um, another advantage about the bot draft is it's cheaper. Um, and it's predictable. So yeah, it's a great way of testing your skeletons, not only building them, but also testing what are the sort of uh, uh, pros and cons of, of particular builds. Uh, okay, so this brings me to the idea of stochasticity and determinism. And basically this is the difference between bot draft and the human draft. So uh, stochastic process is a process that is driven by random effects and you can analyze it and you can interpret it, but it's not very good for prediction because things happen randomly. So uh, it's hard to predict what's going to happen. And this is the thing that will happen very often in human drafts. Human drafts, I can tell you what is the average of uh, people picking up uh, particular cards in, um, in the human draft, 
But on occasion, you will find a particular drafter next to you that uh, does something differently. Uh, and your whole plan goes to the toilet because, uh, because of this unpredictable factor. And that's why drafting the hard way with humans is a very useful skill, because if your plan goes to the toilet, you sort of need to come up with a plan B and drafting the hard way is the best possible plan B because you are very flexible, open and, and reactive to what the table gives you. And you end up with the, you know, maximizing the train wreck, basically. This is the way of uh, thinking about drafting the hard way, in my opinion. Uh, the other type of process is deterministic, and these are driven by non-random processes. Uh, and it's possible to be both analyzed and it is very good in uh, being predicted by, uh, by, 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 by whatever maths. So bot drafts are, so draft is a mixture of both of the processes. There are deterministic processes in it. So for example, Dreadfeast Demon is a bomb. It will be taken early. You won't see it like late. This is deterministic. You can't hope to wheel a Dreadfeast Demon because that's never going to happen. It's as deterministic as can be, but there is stochastic element to it. You know, maybe you were fed by two people that are fighting for a red black, and then you can't draft your red black. Even if you're Josh, probably two people feeding you will be um, uh, too harsh to uh, to draft red black. And this is something that will happen randomly, and you, uh, in some tables it will, in some tables it won't. So you need to sort of try to assess that uh, and. Um, you can't predict it beforehand. You have to sort of become reactive to those things. But in general, bot drafts are more deterministic. Human drafts are more stochastic when you look at it as a sort of spectrum of stochasticity and determinism. Okay, now we go to the numbers. So first of all, ALSA can be used to calculate how many copies of the card are you going to on average see in a draft. And here again, the difference between the bot draft and the human draft is that in the bot draft, this what you will see will be mainly driven by what you open in the pod because the bots are quite predictable. So if on average you will see 0 0.1 of a given mythic uh, per, 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 per pod, um, uh, open 0 0.1 mythic per pod, this won't change by uh, being human or um, uh, or human draft or bot draft. You will always see on average 0.1, and of course will be you know one in some drafts, zero in most drafts, and two in very rare cases. With rares, it's the 0.3 rares are open for each rare uh, in 24 packs, which is a pod. Uh, and again, you will see like zero rares of the particular rare in most drafts. In some drafts, you will see one, and in um, in some you will you will see two if you're lucky, maybe even three. Uncommons, it's uh, almost one, so 0 0.9 uncommon of each uncommon is open uh, in a pod. Again, here most of the pods will have one. Some will have zero, and 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 some will have two or three, but that will be a rare thing to happen. So, but you you can sort of count on one uncommon being open. And then there is uh, 2.4 commons per, per pod open uh, of each common. And this will, again, vary 2, 3, 4, 1, 0. And, and this is based on, th th this will be all uh, based on luck. Because we don't know what is going to be open. And this is the most random part of the, of the forcing, that sometimes you will have a very good forcing plan, very good uh, skeleton, but you just won't open anything that is good for you because just bad luck. And um, you can't um, you can't escape that. That's why you need Plan B, even if you're if, if, even if you're forcing. So again, if an alpha of a card is one, you will only see that card in the packs that you open. And there are some cards that have alpha of one. Basically, people see it, people pick it. And with bots, especially, there are cards that have alpha of exactly one, which means that the bots. 100% of the time will pick it as their first pick. Um, so this means that you will only see it in three packs. And when you think about it in maths terms, if you see 0.1 of this mythic in 24 packs, you will see one eighth of that in uh, three packs. So basically you will see very, 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 very few of that mythic. So this will be only lucky if you open it um, because they will never be passed. So you have to you know, be lucky to open them. Um, so example, yeah, you see three twenty-fourths, one eighth of uh, 0.1 of alsa, one mythics per pod, 
or one eighth of 0.3 uh, of ALSA one rares per pod. Now, if we ramp it up, if ALSA is two, you will see the card on average in the pack you opened and the first pack that you're going to be passed. So you have six packs to see the card. And this, of course, will be in increase this to quarter of the um, uh, quarter of 0.1 and quarter of 0.3 for the mythics and rares, respectively. And if ALSA is over eight, you will see on average all copies of the card opened in your pod. So if you see, um, you will see like 0.9 of the uncommon if the uncommon wheels on average or 2.4 average copies of a common per pod. And that's where exactly, but that's where the money is. So that these are the cards that you can sort of predict that you're going to see frequently in your draft. And if they are the cards that you can build around, you can plan your forcing strategy on that. You cannot plan it on the rares because you very often will depend on whether they were even opened in your pod. And that happens, you know, 30 to 10% of the time, depending on, uh, on the rarity, but with commons and uncommons, you can sort of assume that you will get some of them if they are going late because of the, you know, that they have a high ALSA. So um, this is what I did in terms of analyzing bots in the VAU. I took the cards that have um, a game and hand win rate of over 55% as a sort of artificial cutoff, but it's around the you know average win rate of uh, 17 lands players. So I, I took the cards that have an over, uh, over average performance. And then I looked at the ALSA and I sort of calculated for each. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, important. This is not a generic game and hand win rate. This is, for example, a win rate of only white red cards. So if you can see white red cards, there are not so many of them um, uh, that have a win rate of over 55%. Um, that's why I could actually put it in. For some other archetypes, there, were, there was a much longer list of cards. And then I used ALSA to calculate how many on average of, uh, of those cards you will see per pod, per, per draft. Um, so basically I calculated, okay, this is one roughly. So I'm going to see 3 24th of uh, uh, times 0.3 of welcoming vampires. And then I did the same calculation for wedding announcement and blah, blah, blah. For all of these, I calculated sort of how many of them I see. And this is the result. So basically for blue red deck, I will see on average 39 cards in a draft that uh, have over 55% win rates uh, in this particular archetype. And white red, as I said, the, I picked it on purpose to be, to be put on the first slide because it was the shortest list. I will only see 3.5 cards that have the win rate over 55%. So based on those numbers, it's much more likely that I can force uh, blue red and it's almost impossible to force white red. Uh, yeah, exactly. And but <clears throat> but at least those three arch th 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 those five archetypes, um, um, you will see quite quite some few cards uh, available for them. Now, you have to think that seeing 39 cards doesn't mean that you can pick all 39 of them because some of them will be in the same pack and then is the art of what you should prioritize and what you should pick. So I will see an average of 40 ish, uh, uh, blue, red cards. Uh, <laughs> for science, you see, um, so you will see the 40 cards, but, uh, some of them will be locked and packed with something else. And then you need to be, first of all, able to determine which is the one that is more likely to wheel if you are sort of split between. Uh, the two and you don't have a clear preference and um sometimes you will just have to look I, I have to pick between those two cards because i'm not seeing the other one so uh which one is more important for my deck that's where your uh, prioritization is so important but with 39 cards you have a decent chance of having 23 of them uh, if you if the pod goes slightly in your favor you might have even like um extras so it looks to me like Possibly uh, blue red is an archetype that could be mm, forcible, and the same goes with white um, blue. Uh, and as you can see, maybe, maybe uh, the answer is not not so trivial uh, with others. But um, I'll try to look at it. Right. So cards are made not 
cards are not made equal. Here I calculated the availability of all the cards that have 55% or more game in hand win rate for archetype. But some of those cards are super good and some of those cards are just like barely above replaceable. Uh, so first of all, I looked at uh, bombs per pod for each color combination and bombs I defined as game in hand win rate of over 60%. Now, most of those cards are rares and mythics, but not all of them. Some of them are just very, very good on commons. And <clears throat> uh, when you look at this metric, uh, the top five archetypes have a large amount of them. You will have on average one to two uh, uh, bomby cards per pod. While, if, while with those um, uh, less open archetypes, you will have very few of them. So basically, you're not guaranteed to see even... Well, you're not expected to see even one of them. You will see maybe one per five drafts, maybe one per 10 drafts in case of uh, white red. So if you are interested in a deck with the high power level, obviously these are going to be the better targets because these will sort of, you, you expect to see one or two bombs basically defined as I defined them. Then the next category of the cards, and I think that's a very, very important category of the cards, is great playables per pod. And great playables I defined as having game and hand win rate of 58 to 60 percent. Uh, these are top commons and uh, very good uncommons and some, some rares. So uh, <clears throat> as you can see, um, four of the five archetypes that I told you maybe are forcible have a decent amount of those cards. Like, 11, 8 to 11 um, of those solid playables per pod, while blue-black actually has a very low number. What does it mean? Uh, and you will see that in the next slide, uh, that blue-black has a lot of available uh, cards on the, um, on the uh, just above replacement level. Uh, and other archetypes, pretty low numbers, so uh, they are either not open or they are open, but with like a mediocre level of power. Uh, and as I told you, the fact that Blue Black did not have uh, any of those great playables, it means that it has a lot of playables. And this probably means that you can force a Blue Black deck, but it's not going to be anything spectacular. It's just going to be a lot of cards, but they're going to be uh, bad, unless you can make a superior plan of drafting Blue Black in this format. Um, I would probably stay off it because it doesn't have those uh, strongest cards available in such amounts as, as, as the other four archetypes that I told you. But <clears throat> with the other four good archetypes, you can see around 26 to 20 uh, solid playables, um, which should be enough to make a deck, especially that you know that you have already those 10 decent uh, uncommon or a uh, very good common level of cards and that you uh, have one to two uh, bomby kind of things. So these four definitely look like something that you might be interested in forcing. I would probably be careful about uh, doing the same with blue black just because the most of the cards that are available are low power level. And these, especially white red, I mean white, white red looks atrocious to, to, to be forced in, in, in the bot draft. Which probably means that if we do the when we do the practical um, we're just going to have like wide open uh, white red just to spit in my face and, and, and disprove all the numbers because that's how life operates. So <clears throat> let's go from cards to decks. And this, these are the lists of, uh, of, of, of cards that are, you know, like at, at level where I can expect to see them uh, in, in several archetypes. This is blue, uh, blue, white. And the key cards that you will always get are Nurturing Presence and Cradle of Safety. You will get all the copies that you want, and those cards have a decent uh, win rate. Like Nurturing Presence is uh, approaching 59% uh, um, game and hand win rate. And you will have access to every single one of them that you opened. Like, sometimes you might, you might, you will probably need to gamble and, and try to wheel it, uh, but you know that the bots are not super keen on it, so uh, it's likely to wheel at least if you open it in your pack. Uh, and if you see it pack three, then you have to start thinking how crucial is that nurturing presence because you don't have a guarantee of it being wheeled. But not having guarantee doesn't mean that it's not possible that it won't wheel. 
Uh, another card that you almost get is Cradle of Safety, but that might be a bit of a less of a, a priority, but you know that you have access to it and you know that maybe you don't want to play two, two three of them, but, uh, but probably, um, uh, but probably you might uh, you might want one of those uh, especially if you have some other cards that will work well with that and then we have like some uh, you know above replacement commons you have syncopate you have steel cloud spirit siphon essence uh, evolving wilds uh, you will have access to those if you need to um, here is another good card that uh, you will have a decent um, chance of getting for your deck scattered thoughts um, uh, and another bunch of uh, 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 replaceable commons and kindly ancestor and stitch assistant you will get on average 1.4 traveling ministers which is a good news because you know you can sort of count at least getting one because bots are not drafting it highly enough and that's like a solid card and the same goes with uh, lantern bearer you, you should be able to get one if you uh if you prioritize them uh, uh correctly you might also get one cigardas imprisonment so you get like several of those uh, important cards and you know there will be some variance between them between the pods maybe you know you're if you're sitting in a pod that opened six nurturing presents you can get six nurturing presents now can you make a deck with six i mean i would try and by the way yes uh, mercurio i'm going to make an exception and say hi to you because uh, because you're a good person so yes i shouldn't be talking about uh, highs in the chat but i will make an exception for mercurio um one card that is important to know, Heron of Hope, um, uh, you don't see that many of them. So you see 0.8, which is roughly a third of them, which means that it goes pretty early. The bots don't let you see too many of them. So if you're planning on life uh, synergies, probably bot draft is not a very good place to do so because uh, because you don't see all the Herons of Hope and you probably won't want to have multiples. And then here we are approaching the level where you can see those... Uh, Uncommons that are a bit more open than the others. Brandcomer, you will see around 0.5 of them per draft, which means that uh, they go to pick four, pick five. You can reliably get them pick four, pick five. So that's important, but they probably won't be wheeling very often. Uh, same goes like Bruno Rejection, uh, Fleeting Spirit, Panic Bite Standard, all these things like sort of go like pick, pick, pick three, four, five, I would say, uh, where you can get them. So that means that you will know, uh, at least get, um, uh, oh, maybe even more. Yeah, four, four, is, four, four sounds good. Four, four times three, well, 24, uh, four times three, 12. So uh, half of 24, yeah, that's, that's roughly this. Maybe even five in, in case of Brian Comer. Well, Zach, you wanted, you're complaining that you're iced, but I heard you speculating about trying to bamboozle me into some kind of plot. Should I acknowledge that? No. Um, and, uh, you know, the rest is um, uncommons that you probably have to prioritize and pick relatively early. And it's slightly easier because uh, most of the time you won't have a ch choice between this and a rare because uh, bots are quite aggressive on rare picking. Uh, so that's the blue-white. Then I have uh, black-red. And black-red is relatively open, but it's not open in the way that um, sometimes it is open in uh, human drafts. So, for example, you will see very few of the flameless bolts and abrades and bleed dries. Um, you will see a lot of Vildaran epicures. You will get a lot of uh, undying malice, which is an interesting thing to um, uh, to consider uh, uh, to consider uh, in designing your build, because if Undying Malice is always available, maybe you can build a deck that actually utilizes it very well. You get Wedding Invitation, a uh, uh, plug, shameless plug. I was a guest on the Mythical uh, uh, Mystical Dispute podcast, and we were talking about Wedding Invitation uh, exactly, um, and the strengths and weaknesses of the card. I was replacing uh, uh, to that cubed uh, as the host because, uh, well, he was not well or something, but uh, and, and they were so desperate that they reached out to me. Um, but it's like a good 15 minute episode, so uh, I give it a listen. Um, so other cards, you see Rugged Recluse, you will get access to quite a lot of them. So if you can plan your deck to, you know, reliably turn it into a 3-3, um, you might think about it. 
uh, you will get a lot of pointed discussions, which um, which is good to know again. Uh, you get more Diagraph Scavengers than uh, Falconer Celebrants, so um, uh, this should maybe inform you how you should draft. Blood Grace Socialite, but these cards are like solidly available. You should you should be able to get like uh, roughly you know uh, three or four combination of Diagraph Scavengers, Socialite, and Celebrants uh, if you want. Well, weirdly, Sigarda's Imprisonment is a, a, a powerful card in in in, in Black Red. Yeah, I'm always happy, uh, Josh, to, to to go on your podcast. Last time it was just like a stupid misunderstanding with my, with between me and my software that uh, prevented me. But I'm almost always available. <laughs> almost. Um, <clears throat> so the important part here, I think, is that um, you can count on sort of like two removal cards uh, in your decks from those uh, super efficient removal package, uh, which is not a mighty amount. But you will almost get all the sanguine statuettes that are open, which is important to know if you want to plan something around that, like blood heavy kind of aggressive, uh, aggressive deck. Um, Hero's Downfall is almost as available as uh, Bleed Dry is. So the bots are prioritizing it much less than Hero's Downfall, which is uh, better movement than, than Bleed Dry. Uh, because, of course, we're talking about comparing a common, which you should have 2.4 copies, with an uncommon that you have 0.9 copies. So uh, this is over. you will see over a half of Hero's Downfalls and only oh, uh, under a third of uh, Bleed Dry's. Uh, same goes with Vampire's Vengeance. You will see more than half of those. And you will see more than half of Blood Tithe Harvesters. So, uh, this package is quite interesting because if you're on a slightly luckier side of the variance, you can get quite a lot of those. Weirdly, Bramble Worm is a high win rate card in uh, red black, but people splash those, so you know. Um, and then you have, yeah, Wandering Mind, same, weird, but um, I took the cards without any kind of prejudice, so I took every single copy of whatever. Um, and you get like a decent amount of Ballista Watchers and Alluring Suitors as well. Maybe not more than a half, but around a half uh, or just under a half. So you can count on those cards. And um, and then again, Rending Flame, Parasitic Grasp, you will see a roughly third of them. So I think that <clears throat> this one requires a bit luck if you want to force it. But the good part is that if that bit luck comes in your first two picks and you have first two really, really solid picks for the uh, black red archetype, you know that you're going to get just enough in the in the rest of it um, uh, to um, to build a good deck because and you have to think about it when you when you first let's say you you first pick um, uh, uh, rending flame and then you second pick uh, I don't know. Um, Pelstinger. Uh, you have two two of those cards. It still means that you have like a chance of seeing at least a quarter of a Felstinger and a quarter of a Rending Flame. So like in 50% of the drafts, you're going to get at least one of them still because you only saw two packs. And of course, what you open is not determined by what you opened before. These are independent, uh, uh, independent events. So you will still have a good chance of seeing those cards, like almost as good as uh, as before the draft was started. Uh, 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 okay. Okay. And the last one is um, um, red blue, and here, like the cards that are doing well, that you have access to, is bloody betrayal, alchemist, alchemist's retrieval, and cradle of safety. Now, these are the cards that you probably don't want to load your deck with, except maybe for Bloody Betrayal if you have a right build. But it's good to know that you have access to a lot of them. And then you get like Voldar and Epicure, Wedding Invitation uh, in, 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 in decent amounts. You get access to four counter spells. So if you think about a sort of tempo deck that will make a one drop, two drop, protect yourself with counters, well, Voldar and Epicure, one drop, then any two drop really. Uh, preferably Classic Flame Breather, and then you can start protecting with the counter spells because you will have access to a lot of them. Because you have the Syncopate Siphon Essence, you have the Geist Light Snare. Um, um, uh, the other one is almost always wielding the the three mana um, uh, 
uh, the, the three mana uh, uncommon counter spell. Um, Sorry, I'm gonna catch up with the chat. If the position, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, uh, I'm gonna be talking about that a bit later. What to do because bots are stealing removal. But um, okay, uh, you will see around two ancestral angers per draft. The card has an absurd uh, win rate for for what it does. So uh, definitely, I wouldn't sleep on them. And of course, average of two means that sometimes you will see four because you will see almost all of them that are open in the packs. So. Uh, uh, it's a it's a good strategy to plan around ancestral anger, and you will also see quite a lot of uh, Kessic flame breathers. So uh, the Kessic flame breather plan is also available. So you can think about those two plans, and then supplement them with those super uh, uh, open cards. And then you have like uh, decent things like scattered thoughts. Uh, you can probably easily get a copy of, and probably that's how much you want of it. You have a fearful villager if you want to play the tempo game. They are good on the play. Children's Grave, a very good tempo card. Uh, you have sufficient Lantern Bearer capacity that, that you can count on them. Falcon Rest Celebrants, you should also be able to get one. The problem is uh, with the interaction in terms of Flameless Bolt and Upgrade. So that makes the Alchemist Retrieval with a decent win rate and an, an, an interesting option because maybe instead of removal, you can use the tempo removal and you will have access to something that other people don't have. And the same goes for the Children's Grave, which is if you're playing the right version of tempo, tapping it for two turns might be just enough, as good as a removal. Um, and, um, you know, again, you have a good chance of getting both Vampire's Vengeance and Lunar Rejection, which are both, I think, good good spells for the, for the deck if you, if you build it right. Um, and yeah, Thirst of, for Discovery, you will see roughly half of it. Um, and one thing that I would like to stress here is Diver's Cub is also relatively late. It's a good card. And, uh, well, this is not super perfect with Bloody Betrayal because it costs a lot. But if Bloody Betrayals are open, you might start thinking about the blue exploit creatures as a potential for uh, uh, steal and suck uh, capacity. And then you have those really good um, uncommons that you will be able to get at least, you know, one copy per every three of them basically based on the numbers. So uh, if you have uh, Whispering Wizard, Storm Chaser, Drake, Rending Flame, there's a good chance you will see at least one of them in the draft. So you can count on at least having some part of it. And maybe if you're lucky with the variants, you're going to be able to get it. Um, so of the decks, I gave you the example. I skipped the uh, white black um, just for the uh, clarity of the plan. But basically, the two of the uh, three decks are blue, and two of the three decks that I looked at are red. So this is an idea that I just like very briefly had based on this data. I'm going to start forcing blue-red, but my backup plans will be sw switching to uh, white-blue or black-red, depending on the important cards that I'm going to see. Like, as I told you, Bots are cutting the removal quite uh, efficiently. So if removal is in short supply, I think that the value of Cradle of Safety is, uh, is, is way bigger because people will really depend on that one removal piece uh, that they have. And if I can Cradle of Safety it or Undying Malice it if I'm playing black, um, that might be a decent plan. Um, there is availability of uh, all the copies of Bloody Betrayal that are going to be open, so maybe Blue Exploit gets a slight boost in my pick order, because if I can pick a couple of uh, Blue Exploit creatures and I get like late Bloody Betrayals, that can be an additional plan for the deck. And Nurturing Presence is a very strong card in Blue-White, so if I'm going to see late one of those, uh, I will try to pick them. Now, this is the end of the theory session. I'm going to start now um, my arena and I'm going to jump into a bot draft. Um, and we're trying to, you know, apply this plan and see how far it takes us. Uh, but before that, I would like to thank the 17 Lands team for the uh, support while I'm still on the presentation part. Uh, Viral Misnomer, Hululu, Grant Wu, uh, uh, all amazing people that uh, make the 17 Lands run. And I would like to uh, thank fake Jake Brown, um, also Uncle Cardboard, uh, who was in the chat earlier, who did this awesome logo for the uh, 
podcast version of this uh, seminar that will hopefully appear soon. Um, no, I think that you know the the, the Omnath uh, Nudes, um the the skill set there is quite universal. It's just like it's easier to do it with the quick draft. So I'm focused on the quick draft data because I'm going to do this practical part of it now, where I'm going to try to uh, use the things I found with the data in quick draft. So uh, basically, that was just easier because of that. Um, so yeah, thank you, Fake Jake Brown, for for making the logo and for helping me. Um, to uh, set up the stream so I can record the audio at the end of it and um, release it as a podcast because I knew that some people cannot watch the video. So, uh, well, they will have to deal with maybe a very incomprehensible audio version of it. But if they want to, I'm not going to stop them from. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, blah, blah, blah. I, I will have to jump into cube draft, cube drafts. Uh, at some stage. Uh, okay, play. How does the new thing work? Quick draft. Hmm. That has to be a quick, quick draft. But hopefully we can do it. And the advantage of quick draft and streaming is that I can take all the time I want for my picks. Um, hopefully not too long. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Instantly starting with an interesting pick. Um, so inspired idea would be good in the blue red. A braid, as I told you, is the thing that is a limiting limiting factor, and blood tithe harvester is just a very very strong card. So uh, that's actually an interesting one. Well, as I said, we can force vampires. We can force vampires, and it becomes much better if we start with one of the stronger cards in the in the pack. So, uh, yeah, it's basically the choice between a braid and blood tide harvester. Uh, we have a decent chance of wheeling blood petal celebrant or reckless impulse, uh, or rugged recluse will almost guarantee to wheel. So uh, we we might think about that. Yes, I'm playing a bot draft because uh, because forcing is easier on the bot drafts because they are more predictable. I'm going to pick the Harvester uh, and uh, we'll see. We still have lots of um, uh, red and blue spells to uh, to force, so we can always switch. But it's still according to the plan. Okay, um, there is a Lantern Bearer, there is a Thirst for Discovery, all good cards. There is also a Ballista Watcher, which is a, um, a, a very good card. So I'm just going to pick a Ballista Watcher and uh, if we had a different pick than Blood Tide Harvester, I would just slam the Lantern Bearer for the uh, for the tempo and hope to wheel Siphon Essence or something. And here we have Anger. Maybe wheels, maybe not. But we also have Falcon Rat Celebrants, uh, a good card. We only are, you know, on average, we'll see 1.2 of them per draft. So uh, having one in our deck uh, is not going to hurt it. Oh, that's a very good one. We have a choice of Flame Bless Bolt and Rending Flames. So, again, pretty good sign that uh, uh, at least red is open. Uh, so I'm going to pick Rending Flame. I think it's better than Flame Bless Bolt. Okay, we have Celebrant and Reckless Impulse uh, to choose from. I'll pick the Black Petal Celebrant. Because for my card draw, I want to uh, focus maybe on things like um, um, God, I lost my train of thought. I lost my train of thought. Red is is pretty open. Um, so flame breather is an interesting pick, I think here. I'm just going to. Yeah, point of discussion. Thank you very much, Zach. Now, finally, finally, that's the Zach I was always striving to have in my chat. The one that fills in my point. Um, point of discussion is... Um, uh, point of discussion is, is the thing. Undying Malice is very good with the Harvester, but 
as you can see, I'm 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 not really st stuck on playing uh, vamps. I, I I can switch to any kind of red archetype based on what is open. Um, so I'm not going to go into green, although the infestation expert on the wheel is just like insane. Um, uh, and probably if I was drafting the hard way, I would pick the infestation expert, but that's going to uh, sort of um, avoid, avoid the point of, uh, of, of, of um, uh, what I'm doing here. Uh, here I'm going to pick Chill the Grave uh, because I can always pivot to um, uh, red, blue if I see something interesting in the next packs. You see that blue is uh, open. I told you that the Siphon Essence was a possibility to, to be wheeled. Eh. I'm going to pick the uh, Stitch Assistant and speculate on the uh, Steel Sack, if, if that's an option. Uh, well, I'm just going to get Volt Progress here. Volt Progress. Yeah. Not much Volt Progress here. Oh, chill the great last pick. Why not? Okay. Black is closed. So I think that we abandoned the plan with the uh, Harvester, especially with that we don't have. Um... It is, but it's speculating on, on another card. It's it's. I, I know it's not great, but uh, I'll pick a Biolum Egg. Because now... With the Stitch Assistant, Biolum Egg and the Steel card is uh, are becoming good. And I do know that the Siphon Essence is a decent card. And I will maybe pick one later if that's an option. Oh, that's, that's, that hurts a bit <clears throat> because Visionary is just too good. But I do want that Ancestral Anger to, to wheel, but I'm going to pick a uh, Visionary. Oh, another Rending Flame. Yes, please. Uh, okay, so Wandering Mine, that's a relatively easy pick here. Uh, empty pack, empty pack, empty pack. <clears throat> I mean, Belligerent Guest might be okay because uh, we can pick things like, oh, that's a good one. I'm going to pick uh, Ancestral Anger over the Blood Hypnotist. I'm not playing that kind of a deck that wants three drops uh, aggressively. Here we have our Bloody Betrayal. I think we already have two Childer Graves. Our Chemist Retrieval is interesting-ish, but I'm, I'm just going to try, try, try to get there. Maybe I won't get there, but we have already 17 cards, so we should be good with the playables. And last Lacerate Flash is a sort of possibility. Uh, meh, nothing. I won't even get my fault progress, shame. Okay, second anger, easy, although it's a bit of a shame not to get the... Uh, okay, let's let's do our vampire count. Vampire count. Uh, only three, but that can increase, so I'm just going to anyway pick the marker for attribution. Uh, blah. Blah. Well, it's just um, it's it's just the, how the bots are programmed. Really, it's nothing to do with the with the with reason. That is a good pick. Okay, high fart shaman. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, there's nothing really good in that pack. I can have a choice between the Cat Geist and Witness the Future. Maybe Shaman, but I don't like the splash fixing. As you can see, we didn't see a single nurturing presence in this pack, but that's just variants. We would be seeing them if they were available. Okay, this one, um, maybe I'll just pick Cruel Witness, you know? We need some 
air power at some stage. Uh, so I, I, I really am interested in that wedding invitation, but I will pick a third anger. That's that's much more interesting. And huh, what is the creature count? Twelve, not so many, especially. Oh, now finally we see a nurturing presence. By the way. Scattered thoughts is decent. And so, so I, I'll, I think I'll pick fourth anger and hope that we'll get there on the creatures. Uh, that's a, that's a two drop. That's a cradle. With few creatures, maybe we want to play that cradle of safety, especially with ancestral anger as a protection. Uh, now I'm going to pick a vampire because that makes more likely for us to play the mark of uh, retribution. I'll pick a uh, retrieval. The shame is that we didn't get enough uh, flame breathers. But evolving wild is always nice. Another children grave. Um, we won't get a second throng, I think. But I'm not going to play the witness the future, I think, in this. Okay. Ooh. I made a whole episode on the wedding invitation and I'm passing it now so late, but I think we need creatures a bit. And we have scattered thoughts and uh, inconsequential, inconsequential. In a situation where there were four red cards in one pack, is the order in which bots take them certain? Um, we don't know enough about bots to know the order being certain, but there is definitely you can bet on one of them being more likely to wheel than the others. Huh. Told you about Vault Progress. Look at it. Three. Uh, three. Wild cards. So, bloody betrayal plan didn't work, I think. We don't want this, we don't want this. Mm. Probably fewer of those. Maybe only one reckless impulse. I can take out the whole Biolum egg and stitch the assistant package. That will be better. I think so, because with only one sacrifice outlet, I'm not super happy to play an 0-4 for 3 mana. This deck only wants one thing, and it's disgusting. Uh, 11 creatures. We definitely cannot cut another creature. Uh, we have two Rending Flames. I can cut this. Because we have so few creatures, I do put some weight on the uh, Retrieval and Cradle of Safety. I think the big problem of the deck is that we didn't, um, we didn't get a um, sufficient number of, or any number of the... Um, Voldar and Epicures. And we need to make one more cut. What is our vampire count? Four. That's a bit low for a marker for attribution. But I will stick to it. I do want to play 17 lands. Ah, oh, no, I'll just cut this retribution. We we'll have to deal with the removal we're given. And that's two rending flames and a couple of children graves. We didn't get a couple of the um, of the important um, early drops. We didn't get lantern bearers. We didn't get epicures. So that's a bit of a shame. 
but we also are not playing super heavy on counters. Well, let, 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 let's, let's see how we can get with this. <clears throat> I will keep 8-8 uh, eight, eight, uh, because of the um, double pipped cards in blue. But we are definitely more red than uh, blue. But two cruel witnesses, I want to have the access to two blue. Okay. Let's see. But at least... At least... Um, you can see that um, the initial plan of uh, trying to be blue-red was quite easily achieved. And yes, there is an argument to be made that in this particular draft, maybe we would be better off by drafting green-red. Uh, but I think that the forcing strategy on average will, will just play out. Okay, keep seven. Very, very aggressive start of doing nothing for the first two turns. Ah, oh. taste of our own medicine. Parish blade trainee. Okay. Oh, that's going to be a surprise. But at least we didn't miss. Ooh. We can get value with the band spell. End of turn. Hmm. I have to kill this thing. It will be too annoying. And evolving wilds to the rescue for mana fixing. I won't attack because we're a bit low on life. Okay. A noise. They don't have anything in exile now. Okay, this is becoming a slightly problematic card. So, what is our plan? Okay, so the idea is we will have to take one hit with it. Okay, do I want to chill the grave? Yes, it will become an option next turn. Because we're basically digging for our removal spell.
we have the cradle of safety to sort of stop them from removing it. Okay, yeah, that's unfortunate, but that has to happen. Interesting. The word is super annoying. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm up for that one. And not up for that one. Ooh, interesting. Griff Rider, sure. Mm. I'd rather, you know, get the counter spell or whatever interaction. I'll resistance. Uh, it's a bit annoying. But they are down to one card. We don't want that. make a stop on their upkeep so that they can draw into a counter spell. Mm. Okay, let's see what they have. Okay. Okay. Oh, we have to try it. <laughs> See? Tempo. Just ignore the creatures. Ignore the creatures and then, then once you have a board presence, then you're in the game. Yeah, that was a bit lucky there. Because it was a problematic 6-6, um, we don't have that much to do with it. <laughs>
I mean, we could have gone with the bounce spell as well. That would have ruined the whole shenanigan that they had. And turns out lots of ancestral angers are just good. But okay. It's always good to win. Why have you been owned again, Zach? Oh, as rarely as I do it, <laughs> keep six. I'm going to ship crew a witness here. Oh, you thought I would lose? Oh. I find your lack of trust disturbing. Okay, this one is going to be pretty annoying for me. This deck in general, I'm pretty sure. Oh, are they keeping a syncopate? Oh, God. Look, I shipped the crew witness. We can get back to crew witness. Zero surprise. Okay, sharpshooter. Annoying. We would definitely want to see an island here. Wait, wouldn't they? No, they wouldn't play. I decided to block it because, uh... okay. Okay, interesting. What are they going to do with it? Okay. A bunch of creatures that are not... Oh, that's slightly, slightly annoying because we will transform the Weaver of Blossoms. But we can tap the Werewolf and draw a card and they won't be able to train. Because now the question is, do I want them to draw cards or do I want them to... Oh, God. That is a problem. Well, we will have to chain quite a lot of them. Ah. 
I think that they were, I don't know what they were worried about. But... Oh, if they have a counter spell, it's, oh God. You know what? I think we don't go and we're not gonna win against the Hellbreaker Hollow. There 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 are things we can deal with, but there are things we can't. I'll cut my losses and, and move on to the next game where I hopefully won't see that atrocity. I don't know why they played it uh, main main phase. Yeah, exactly. Well, not that I have any counters, but it was also we didn't have a fast enough start. That syncopate on the <clears throat> Voltaic Visionary was uh, a bit of a backbreaker. But hey, we got them for 11. <laughs> okay, let's win this game. Yeah, that's 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 a good plan. That's the plan I can totally, totally uh, uh, endorse. That's the word. Okay, well, it's not not perfect, but. See, this is the thing that in my tempo decks, I want to have one and two drops, and then I have one, one or two drop, and then I can hold on to interaction. Sure, but I still get my effect. Against this particular deck, I definitely want to have my Rending Flames. Nature's Embrace. Well, they, they definitely they definitely build up to something. Thank you for the follow, unfortunately. Oh, no. That's a bad miss. Wow. That's some aggro plan. Oh dear, that's so bad. That's so bad. <laughs> uh, can't even play the flame breather and anger because that will be just... Suicide mission. But in all fairness, that's just a dumb five five. I can take take that damage for some time at least. I'd rather them not having a removal for this. I'm going to burn one because I just want to draw into some land. The Bramble War makes racing a bit annoying. Wow, that's ultra aggressive. Sure. I'm going to play a sort of slow game here and play Chill the Grave because I want to play Ballista Watcher with them. Um,
Ballista Watcher with the protection from Cradle of Safety. Okay, that will do. I thought that they might have a second wolf strike that they used it so willy nilly on the. Okay. Child is annoying. Ooh. We have to kill the child. Yeah, but I thought maybe they double block or something. And I don't want to do that. Yeah, no, that's just too much value. But I can't swip flip tonight. Okay, they are thinning their library clearly. Now well, we have to gamble a bit. Well, if they have witches web, then we can't. That's the unfortunate truth. Ah, oh, that's super annoying. Just enough mana, damn it. Well, now definitely we cannot. No, we can't. <clears throat> yeah. GG. No, we were a bit screwed on the lands this this game. Sometimes it just doesn't come together. But we almost got there in the end. But almost is not 
exactly. I said, this deck has a problem. I didn't get enough early drops for uh, the plan to be very successful. It's like really lantern bearers are quite important. Maybe I don't think I was in a position to pick lantern bearer over um, Yeah, exactly. It was definitely worse than Midnight Hunt. But there is not such a good cheap removal in this. Although we are, you know, we have two rending flames. That's that's as good as it gets, really. Yeah, exactly, because because of the lack of the early drops. If you go one drop, two drop, you can then stay open with syncopates all all, all night long. But um, and we also can't really, realistically, because we are more, more, more of a mid-range version of this deck. Okay. And of course, not great that... Not great that we're not on the play, but... What do we see? Forest. Okay, forest we can see. If they want to burn a braid on the flame breather, fine. Oh, Dr. Glut, they don't have a braid. Okay. So we're playing against Jund, of all the things. We're a prisoner, okay. So we probably have to play, play our spells, because otherwise we are dealing with a big thing. A weary prisoner is not exactly the perfect card when we want to play our tap out strat, uh, our, our reactive strategy. Wow, two weary prisoners definitely not a great thing. Oh yeah, probably, probably. So. At least we can fuel our okay spell addiction. That's that's great to see from the top because that stop gives us a better chance of double spelling. Maybe I should have attacked with this belligerent guest and killed one of the prisoners. Ooh, they go flippy. We have to hit one ancestral anger there. There we go. That's not... Oh, yeah, that's, that's okay. That's okay. Oh, 
it's going to be a little cat and mouse game here. Well, alas, alas. But slowly we're entering the zone where we can have them live and attack us. We just need maybe like a chilling play or something. Let's get the red mana. Little pings. Oh, where is the mouse? Where is the mouse? Come on, Arena, don't. Uh, oh, Tappy Tapper. Pick the anger and the wandering mind. And actually, I'm going to play the Anger here. Okay, we almost get them to the level where we are happy having them. And if they want to flip them, that's no more spells. They don't use blood, so I'm pretty sure that they have spells in their hand. Uh, now, probably the six mana removal. Uh, old Rutstein. Well, they won't flip. We have a bit of a breather here. They got themselves a treasure. Undead Butler, that should be fine. I think we're good. Well, that was a fun game. All right. Well, I love those mini games. Like, how many turns can I double spell in a row? Turns out, quite a lot of them. But if they killed that cruel witness, we would have been in a world of trouble. <laughs> ah yes as much as I despise Clarkson this meme is pretty good the, oh no anyway oh no anyway Yeah, Jeremy Clarkson. Oh. We have mana. Ah, excellent. At least we get to our double blue. 
and cruel witness can be pretty good against those uh, Okay, let's thin the deck because we don't want more lands, actually. Hmm. Spirit, you say? Annoying. Okay. Things on board. Now this looks like potential cradle. Hmm. Oh, that will be fine. I have a plan of bouncing the Soul Cipher board once it becomes a creature, but um, we might keep it for protection of our witness as well. Witness protection. Ooh. Like, come on, white blue. Okay, there goes the plan for bouncing the board, but okay, I'm, I'm up for that. Sure. Okay, another rending flame, and they are a bit short on mana, so I'm just going to play it a bit slow with the uh, with the ancestral angers. I want to get the value. I'm not in a hurry to play them. I have four red mana. I can I can do plenty once they tap out. Shame. No problem. So I think that they do have some kind of interaction spell. Okay, that was the last land I played in this game.
Maybe I should have played it after attack six. Oh, I'm not saying this is the last land I played in this game because I might still play one from the Reckless Impulse. Okay. Are they going to be flipping, flipping the board? Okay, they have plenty of steel clad spirits. See, I will play one more land, but in a way that is inobtrusive to my game plan. Okay, we're getting there. And this thing I will just kill before they untap so they don't get value. They transform it now. Oh. Strange. I thought I have time to. Oh, I'm not going to block it. Question is, what are they going to do now? My turn. Okay, well, if it's my turn, then I'm going to dig for things. I will play another land. Guess what? Wash away. It's washed away. And I think before anything happens, I'll try to do that. Hopefully they don't have the cradle. If it's a syncopate, pretty good. Okay. That's decent. We got rid of this card draw engine, so 
they don't get too much advantage. Okay, annoying. But... Hmm. That's four. Now let's try. We have a lot of digging there to do. Okay, I'm, I'm up for keeping that. We're still having sufficient life cushion. Now I can still do this. Mm. Yes, please. Hopefully. Just to be sure. Oh, that worked. Astra Anger, hell of a card. Hell of a card. All right. We're living on the edge here a bit, but... From one to two to three two, definitely at least got us to a three three. But yeah, it's a bit of an uphill struggle with this deck. It's getting late. But I need to finish this draft. Opponents, kill me, please. But I can see that Cruel Witness is doing miracles in this version because, because of lack of Lantern Bearer. Okay. Well, we go first at least, so... So we can uh, we can get to three mana and do nothing earlier than the opponent can. Ah, now we have something to look for in our lives. <coughs> Okay. That's pretty annoying with the exile clause. Don't miss. Oh no. Maybe they think it pinks for one. Oh dear. It happens.
Let's see. Is it favorable for me to block? They they definitely have a trick, but if they have a trick. Okay. That is annoying. I just need to get them rid of their hand and and rending flame the spirit. That, that's the plan, basically. You know? But I think, I don't know, opponent must be doing something else while, while they play. Okay, Paris play training. That's annoying. Oh, do they have a pink card? Oh, well. If they do have it, they do have it. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if they have it, they have it. Nothing I can do about it. Maybe they don't. You know, I'd rather prevent three damage than. Boom, baby. Well, now they're thinking about attacking. Like this attack is something that absolutely doesn't give me any incentive to block anything. I'll take one damage any day, because why wouldn't I? Okay, Militia Rallyer. It's fine. So I'm just going to Rending Flame this thing. And depending on if I drew a land or not, play Ancestral Anger on the Belligerent Guest. And if not, then play the Voltaic Visionary. Okay, it's got the Vigilance and additional Vigilance. I can kill it basically. That's actually be probably a, a better option here. Because it doesn't die now. I get myself a nice blood. And get to play visionary. Happy times. And now I can happily slam oh torrents. Torrents is something I want to kill. Again, not having the slightest plan of blocking anything. Plus two, plus two, indestructible. That's the annoying trick, isn't it? Uh, 
Okay, but nothing. I have, I'm still in the market for playing spells. Mm. That makes me think that they do have some kind of a trick. I'm going to risk it for the biscuit. Maybe the switch is well. There we go. <clears throat> sure. Also sure. Let's do that before we do any plans. Okay, now it's time to use the trick. No, that's pretty good. No, oh, sorry, there is no, um, uh, there is no deck list. I, I'm going to show it after this game. Oh, annoying. Sheltering bows. Cool. So if it's sheltering bows, is there a good reason not to tap it at the end of the turn? There's 14. No, there's no good reason. I'm just going to tap it because I can play two angers on both of the creatures. Okay, I don't even need to play on both of the creatures. We need the mountain. One more shot at the mountain. No mountain. That's nine. actually that's a bit of a gambler's thing but uh, all right Ah, uh, it's a shame. But they would still be at one. So, I mean, I had to draw a mountain, then I could have played the Anger and Cradle of Safety, but... It's uh, been a deck that we decided to force. Okay.
So now we play this one. So it gets, it's a six. It's a six power creature. Hopefully that's game. Hopefully, but not certainly. So piercing light fierce retribution. Let's do this. And now they block with one, I kill the creature that's blocking the trampler. They block with both, I kill one creature, I trample enough. They don't block it, they die anyway. Yep, game. Sure. Well, that kills you. Am I miscalculating something? Four, eight. Maybe they forgot trample. Yeah. Well, anyway, it was a one game. But opponent did not give themselves a chance. Okay, tough one, but uh, all the games with tempo decks are tough. Okay, uh, Miguelito, uh, this is the deck, just before we start the next game. Um, so four angers, basically a couple of wandering minds, a couple of rending flames and very, very, very bad creatures in general. Uh, only one flame breather, which is a bit of a pain. Um, crew witnesses were doing quite a, quite a lot of work. Cradle of Safety as a card that is potentially good in those uh, bot drafts. So, yep, yeah, that was the deck. Let's try to win one more. But at least it got a positive win rate. So, forcing does work a bit. Mm, oh. I cannot disrespect an opponent that plays Mirage Swamps. Mm. A nat natural lantern, that's that's nice. Nah, I'm not gonna bolt this bird. No, Mirage lands, high respect. Fine.
Oh, I could have played the anger actually. I should have played this anger. Use the mana when you can, okay? Phalanx. That is adorable. Well, they can have, uh, you know, the zombie lord. I'm assuming that they do have a zombie lord. Sorry, it's a bit of a pain. <sighs> sure. Game. Always check if you have lethal. <laughs> Sorry. I could totally ignore you there in the corner, supporting the walls. As you can see, none of those things were particularly dangerous. The dangerous things was, was really removal, but I had the cradle. Now that, that was the kind of a game that we want to see. Okay, we got to, to five wins. Slowly, slowly, we can start thinking about the unthinkable and actually trophying with the forest deck. And that even after this pathetic one to start. But, you know, I'll be happy with five three even. Okay, keep. Like that's pretty much reminds the last game. Uh, is this incubate? No. Oh. So what is that? They can have Hero's Downfall or they have Parasitic Grasp, maybe. maybe. We shall see. Thank you for the follow. Actually, I can actually check who, 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 who got the follow. Okay, Article of Thraben. Uh, let's just do optimistic plays. Desperate farmer. That's fine. Slightly annoying. No blocks. Makes racing slightly harsher. Oh, that's annoying. Oh, 
I'm gonna use them while I can. Happy to keep. Sure. Point in discussion, excellent. That's excellent. Oh, the plethora of things I can take from here. I just don't want to see all those things at the bottom, to be fair. Hmm. There are 10. Plus four, six, four. I'm not gonna win that race. I need to take Rending Flame, unfortunately. No attacks. Ducks will? Uh, not yet. No. Headless Rider. Annoying. No box. Blood Fountain. Bit annoying. But maybe if they use it. I can get some extras from my cruel witness. Okay, that's going to be tricky. But I can easily sacrifice the Cruel Witness to chump. Mm -hmm. Two can play this game, I see. But Belligerent Guest can block the Desperate Farmer. Okay. Whatever. Okay. They still play lands, which is which is mighty scary. Okay, whispering wizard, that's fine. Don't forget to crack it. Don't forget to crack it. At least I got those adorable spells somewhere, not on the bottom. Okay, so if I pass the turn, I can start killing the uh, the things, but we 
they have a spell? No. That's a bit that's a bit too risky, I think, to to sleep comfortably. Yep. You know what, maybe, maybe let's do it like that. Not to give them two zombies. Okay. Cobble plants. Okay. What did the exile? Oh, Headless Rider. One card. <sighs> Maybe I should have played the scattered thoughts to be fair. Okay, so Ancestral Anger wins us the game, so let's try that. If they have a counter word, the deep shit. So, should I kill? Okay, they attack with three things. So, if they attack with three things. Okay, is that a wizard, human wizard? Mm. So the, the problem is, I'm worried that the wizard can be annoying if they replay it. And now they don't have a counter, and they can draw into a counter, and then we're screwed. So I'm just going to do that. And I know that there's the two damage from the spirit, potentially. I do know that.
but I can deal with the spirit in multi plethora of ways. Okay. Cool. Nine. Tap the spirit and I... Ah, uh, no. Ping the spirit. Attack. Pass the turn, ping them twice. That's the plan. Yeah. Sure. Get in. See, there was, there, there was a path, there was a path. Indeed, pinged lethal, but it had to be done exactly in this way. So, quite fortunate. All right, we entered 6-2. So maybe we can even trophy with that um, uh, practice deck which is very good for my bladder. Because whatever happens after this game, I can finally get to the loo. And I don't want to make a pause just before the last game because there's, there's no point. But yeah, I mean, starting one, two, I'm quite happy. Yeah, 6-2, Zach. We're 6-2. Okay, good, good. Evolving Wilds again. Yes, I love you, Evolving Wilds. I mean, you in shambles, basically, no? Is that, is that good? Oof. Flameless bolt, a braid. Ooh. Good catch. Wow. Chandra. Don't tell me you have Epicure. Good. <laughs> Chandra Buster. Oof. Troublesome. No, well, it's a trophy game. I mean, obviously, it's going to be problematic. Cigarda's imprisonment, but hopefully they are a bit short on cards here. Oof. Yeah, pingy ping, pingy ping. It does seem ironic. <clears throat> oh. 
Oh, wow. They got to go deeper. Okay, so Ballista Watcher was something. Are they going to exile? Yeah. Okay, that at least makes me a bit more comfortable about what's going on next. <sighs> I'm still going to belligerent cast. Hopefully that... There we go. I mean, we're getting low on life. I, I do agree with that. But we definitely made pay due diligence on the protection of the... Uh, that one mana extra wouldn't kill. Okay, now they dig. But yeah, this is a scary matchup. Scary matchup. Hopefully they won't dig into anything. Oh, they did epic hero. We should have to start doing something soon because we're gonna die painfully if we don't. I'm pretty sure that this deck has plenty of answers. Okay, okay, okay. No, they can't attack really, can they? Unfortunately, this is most likely we're gonna draw into into lands. That's what I wanted to say. But I forgot that we have this. And yes, living the very, 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 very dangerously. Well, that was very unlikely that to happen. So can we win without this? Uh, that's three, two. I'm just wondering what should I return to their hand? But if they have another spell, I'm going to be, if they have another spell, I'm going to be dead anyway. Well, yeah. The, the, I don't think I can even deal 18 damage, but uh, 17 damage. But one can hope. Now, that's not going to be enough in any way. But not terribly far. It's 
a bit too much removal from the opponent's side. Okay, so this is your uh, Boros uh, Nurturing Presence deck. Lovely. And you know, I mean, I would have loved to have three uh, Flame Breathers in my deck. Because with four Ancestral Angers, this becomes like a very potent um, engine. But we were a bit on the unlucky side of the variance in terms of what was open in the pod. Still, 6-3 with a forced deck where we basically decided what to draft before we opened the first pack. And we stuck to the plan. The plan was flexible in parts. And hopefully now you can uh, sort of replicate this kind of approach. And if you didn't watch the seminar part of it, I would uh, advise you to go back to that and, and, and see how I assumed that white, red, uh, blue, red, and uh, black, red, and um, 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 blue, white are the most open colors in the bot draft. Uh, yeah, I got the back, gems back because probably I got a couple of rares there. So let's see, time price. Yes, I got the gems with 100 extra and a pack. So yeah, 100 gems plus by forcing a deck uh, based on analyzing uh, what bots pick and what bots don't pick. So yeah, good games. And thank you very much for joining.